Hey everyone, welcome back. The topic of today's video is cinematics, or rather how to make your renders more cinematic. Now I know that cinematic is a term that's kind of thrown around a lot. It's often, it, it may or may not be misused. For the sake of this video, when I say cinematic, I mean something that's very filmic, something that's very movie-like, something that you would actually believe yourself seeing in a movie theater, right? It's that magical feeling you get when you see this beautifully well-lit, well-composed shot that just makes you just stare in awe. And that is what we want in our renders. And fortunately, it doesn't necessarily take all that much to make your shots go from kind of mediocre to wow. So let's jump right in. So let's start off with the first thing. There is one thing that is very often overlooked in game engines like Unreal and Unity, and that is frame rate. So because Unreal is a game engine, it has, at least up until recently, been used mainly by game artists. And in games, the higher the frame rate, the better. Get that sweet, sweet 60 FPS or even 120 FPS. The high frame rates have been prized by gamers time and time again. So that's why you see a lot of shots rendered out of Unreal on ArtStation and social media that have been rendered in this smooth 60 FPS. And while that can look nice, it's not cinematic in the slightest because it tends to look like a soap opera or worse, a video game cutscene. So here's the dirty secret, 24 FPS. No more, no less. For the love of all that is holy on this good earth, do not render in 48 or 60 or even 120 FPS, okay? So 99% of movies out there are shot in 24 FPS for a reason, and that's because of motion blur. Motion blur, when shot at 24 FPS, and assuming you're using the 180 degree shutter rule, will provide the most natural and cinematic looking motion blur you can possibly get. So in real life with a real camera, shutter speed is what determines your motion blur, right? But what is this 180 degree shutter rule? The 180 degree shutter rule means that your shutter speed should be double what your frame rate is. So let's say your frame rate is 24 FPS, you should be shooting with a shutter speed of 1 48th of a second. But Unreal doesn't have shutter speed. Most 3D applications don't. So in Unreal, to set the motion blur correctly, in your post-process volume, you need to set the motion blur value to 0 0.5. 24 FPS will give you the most natural and most cinematic looking motion blur, I promise you. So here we have two renders, one at 24 FPS and the other at 60 FPS. Notice the difference that frame rate and motion blur makes. One looks like a video game and the other one feels much more natural. Yes, the 24 FPS one is more blurry, but that's a good thing. So just to give you an example of how motion blur is very important in movies and TV shows is to look at these examples from The Mandalorian. So pay attention to just how blurry most of these frames are. So this is a still image captured from one of their behind the scenes videos. And look at these TIE fighters, they're completely blurry. Because of the motion blur, the rocks and the mountains that are nearer to the camera are also completely blurred out. Take a look at this next one as well. The people moving, they're completely blurry. Once you get some depth of field in there, some lens distortion, you've got some haze, you've got some motion blur. These images aren't very sharp at all, but they look very good. So while you may not think that motion blur is a good thing, it is, because all movies have motion blur, and a ton of it as well. Yes, as I said, there are some movies that have been shot in 48 or 60 FPS, but they are exceedingly rare. We're trying to make our renders look as cinematic and movie-like as possible. And if you want to do that, you need to render your frames the same way you would shoot footage in real life. Rendering at a frame rate any higher than 24 will give you a kind of a, it's going to look like a video game cutscene. I, I hate to say it. And because we're already rendering in a games engine, it's going to look like a video game and not a movie. If that's what you want, and that's fine, but that's not what we're going for here. So the only exception to the rule where you may want to be rendering in 48 or 120 FPS is when you're trying to do slow motion footage. So let's say you want your render to be two times slow-mo you need to render at double your frame rate. So you need to render at 48 FPS, and then you'll slow that down in post. So that 48 frames in, that were captured in one second will be stretched over two seconds. So next up is how film back and depth of field work together. These two things can make your shots really pop. This is yet another little thing that game artists tend to overlook because depth of field in video games tends to be a little bit annoying and it's promptly discarded. But do not overlook how powerful depth of field can be. 
Just think of any movie where you have a close-up of two characters. Dips of Field is very often used creatively here. And honestly, Depth of Field is a great way to just hide all the garbage in your background. Depth of Field is awesome for that. But, but now, what's Filmback? Filmback is kind of a term that you, know, you might not be familiar with. Filmback is essentially the sensor of your camera. So if, imagine like an actual DSLR or mirrorless camera. The sensor itself, that's what we call the Filmback. And you can choose the size of this in Unreal. This is also how you set your aspect ratio. In general, at least in real life, with a real camera, the larger the sensor, the better it is. This is why full frame cameras and medium format cameras are so sought after because they have a much bigger sensor. So go ahead and play with the film back settings in Unreal and you'll notice that the bigger the film back, the wider your field of view is. So you may be wondering, well, how does this make my shot look better? That brings me to my next point. Now, because suddenly your film back is bigger, you have a wider field of view. This means that you can now use a longer focal length to, and get the same field of view but get a much stronger depth of field. Now, this is where things get a little bit weird and arbitrary, but bear with me. Allow me to demonstrate right here. So here we are in Unreal. We've got a simple environment and a little character here. So let's create a new camera so we can compare the different film back results. Okay, so I'm gonna create a camera by clicking on this button right here. And now we're in this camera. I gotta frame my shot like this, something like that. And now I'm going to select my camera and in the details panel, I'm going to move the manual focusing distance back on our subject here. So if you don't already know, the manual focusing distance focus plane will help you know where your focus point is, right? It's a super useful tip if you don't already know it. So I'm gonna hide this. So now this is the framing that we got with our film back set to right here, 16.9 digital film. This is the default setting. Personally, I like having it set to 69 DSLR. And what happens when I click on this? Okay, you'll see suddenly your shot gets much wider. This is different than just changing the focal length. So, what this does is it's going to increase the size of your sensor, so to speak. So, now we can get even closer to our subject by and get the same framing. But because we've moved closer now to get the same framing as before, we need to adjust our focus again. And since we're closer, the more you move the focus point closer to you, the more your background gets blurry, okay? So this is kind of a cheap way of, uh, of accentuating your depth of field by getting a larger sensor up to a point. And that brings me to my next point, focal length. So because 35 millimeter is the default, they are wildly overused. They're boring, it's not exciting. You know, when you wanna get really close to your subject, you just get this weird distortion. It doesn't look very good. It's not flattering to the human face to have a 35 millimeter lens especially when you get up close. So go long, go set it to 85 millimeters, set it to 200 millimeters. And I have another example right here where I compare like a 150 mil lens and a 35 mil lens. And the difference is just pretty shocking. So in this case, let's take a look at our focal length. So right now we're using, in this camera, we have a focal length of 150 millimeters, okay? And we get this very tight shot, very close up, very personal look, and with a very nice blurred out depth of field. But look at the aperture, the aperture is F10. If I were to set this to 2.8, which is the default, the background's even more blurry, okay? So I'm gonna leave this at F10 because that's the look that I wanted, but let's create a brand new camera. I'm gonna duplicate this camera here. So we're gonna call, I'm gonna call this one camera wide, all right? And I'm gonna go here, and all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the focal length. So bring it down from 150 to 35 millimeters. And now you'll see, look at the difference that we have here. This is the previous camera, 150 mil versus 35 millimeter. The difference is staggering, it's just day and night, right? Now, of course, we can try to frame the shot the same way that the longer lens would frame, right? So we can move closer with the 35 mil lens right here. Let's do something like this, up close and personal, Something like that. So this is the tight lens and this is the wide lens. Do you see the impact that this has? Look at that difference between the wide and the long lens. It's completely different. This is what I mean by understanding what focal length does because it has such a dramatic impact on your shot. So, and this is at F10. If I wanted to have this at 1.4 and I need to move the focus plane back here. Now, you'll see it's a totally different look, right? It's This can be the look that you want. I'm not saying that shouldn't be what you do, but a lot of movies use long lenses for a reason, and in CG, going with the long lens really 
helps help make things feel a little bit more realistic. So this right here is the best example I could come up with to really demonstrate the effects of focal length and how it contributes to the final look of your shot. So I'm going to go ahead and press the play button here. And we start off with a very wide shot. And as the focal length gets longer, you'll notice how it compresses that background constantly. Now I know it's a little bit trippy to look, look at, but all I've changed here is the focal length and the position of the camera in order to keep the framing of our character here the same. So just to show you guys what, what we're doing here is we have a focal length of 10 millimeters to start off with. Next up, we go to about 35 millimeters. And last, we have about 150 millimeters. So looking at the, the difference here, going long really compresses that background. It really accentuates your depth of field. It gives you a very different look. Like, pay attention to the foreground here, foreground and the midground. Notice how out of focus those are with all that depth of field. But here, uh, the foreground is not, there's no depth of field at all, right? We haven't changed the f-stop. We haven't changed the aperture size. We've changed nothing except for focal length and the position of the camera. So of course, you know, as you go longer, you need to back the camera up to keep the framing the same, right? You know, this requires you to really understand how focal length works. So I'm gonna play this one more through for you guys, just so you can get a better idea of the effect it has on your shots. Go long, okay? A long focal length really goes a long way into helping you get a much more interesting look. It's just, I myself rarely work with anything under 85 millimeters. 85 is probably my favorite focal length ever, both on real cameras and in 3D. Longer focal lengths get up close and personal, and they have the added benefit of really accentuating your depth of field. Okay, so f1.4 on a 35 millimeter is not going to be the same as f1.4 on a 200 mil lens. Go ahead and try it out and see it for yourself. You may be surprised. And this brings me back to another point to where all of this kind of ties together, okay? So first we have our film back, which affects our framing, and we can fix that and change that with our focal length. But what about aspect ratio? Where does that fall into place? Most movies we see nowadays are in a format called 2.35 to 1. 2.35 to 1 is the super wide cinemascope aspect ratio that we're very used to seeing. You've probably seen it a lot, you know, with the black bars and the top and bottom of the frame. This is a very popular look. I'm personally, I'm a sucker for the 235 look. I love it. I put it, I use it in almost all my renders just because I think it looks so awesome. Now, the reason why I think having this aspect ratio is so appealing is because we instantly have the association with movies. We've seen it in films, we've seen it on TV. It's the immediate association that you have with it, right? Does this mean that a movie has to have the 235 to 1 aspect ratio for it to be cinematic? Of course not. No, I mean, I've, you, you can find some amazing looking films that have been in 4.3 or 16.9, what have you. 235 to 1 is just what's popular and trendy nowadays. Personally, I love it, but it's up to you. It's kind of one of those, those little extra things that are really easy to change and do it or add to your frame. You can just add two black bars on top of your thing and it's going to kind of help a little bit. So just because you've added those black bars on the top and bottom of your frame doesn't really mean that your shot's automatically going to be more cinematic. Now I pour my heart and soul into this lovely example showing you why adding the black bars doesn't necessarily make your shot cinematic. <laughs> Need I say more? You get the point. Now, the last part of this video involves poke production. And this is quite easily the most important, most overlooked, and most underrated part of this entire process. I understand the allure of getting everything right in Unreal, getting everything right in your render, hit the render button, post art station, call it a day. But you're shooting yourself in the foot. When you hit that render button in Unreal and you get your frames out, you're only halfway done. Anyone who's ever worked in VFX knows that the work that compositors do is the stuff of legends. I can't tell you how many times I sent stuff to the render farm and, you know, they were decent looking renders, but after it goes through the compers and the poke production and color correcting and the colorist, when I see that final result in theaters or even in our daily meetings, I am constantly just shocked at the work that post production people do, okay? Color correcting and editing your footage in post is so important. God, you, you really need to start doing this if you haven't already. 
it is so critical to making your shots go from mediocre to amazing, okay? And fortunately, there's not that much you need to do. Either sometimes it's just some curve correction, a little bit of contrast, adding some bloom. You don't need to be a super advanced compositor to really make your shots pop. A lot of what makes your renders look better is, honestly, crapifying them. Crapify, is that a word? Basically, you need to add an extra layer of badness on top of it to really make it feel more real. By that I mean lens effects. And I don't mean that adding the J.J. Abrams lens flares, that's not what I mean. Lens flares, when used tastefully, are amazing. I'm talking more stuff like film grain, chromatic aberration, adding a little bit of blur in post. But you know, your lens could be smudged or something, it could be dust, there could be having some dust spots in your sensor. There is so much that happens between your subject and the sensor of your camera, and that's the lens. There are so many refractive glass elements in there, it's going to deteriorate your image, however slightly. And that is what we go add in post-production. So let's jump into DaVinci Resolve and see the main thing that I do to my renders to kind of give them that extra oomph. Just a disclaimer here, this is not going to be a proper color grading tutorial. I will be making a video about this soon, so hit the subscribe button and the bell notification so that you don't miss it when it releases. So right here, I'm mainly going to show you what it is I do and how I grade my images, just to give you an idea of my process. So with that being said, let's carry on. So now that we're in the color page of DaVinci Resolve, you may be a little bit overwhelmed by everything that's happening here. It's like, oh my goodness, so much information, what's going on? Don't worry, you'll see it's a lot easier than it looks. So let's start off with a little before and after here. This is the final graded shot, and this is what I got out of Unreal. Now you'll see it's a little bit flat, a little bit boring, the lighting is way too warm. It's not very interesting to look at, right? So now you'll notice the main elements are there. The lights in from the right direction. The lighting is actually decent. We got some bounce lighting coming here. The main lighting is there. I'm just going to give it a bit more oomph with some very simple nodes here. Okay, so let's start off with the first thing. I like starting off with my shot by bumping up the a curves adjustment, as you can see down here. We're just lifting up those highlights, lifting up those blacks, adding a little bit more contrast with the help of curves. As you can see, we're already seeing a pretty substantial difference here, right? A lot more oomph to it. Next down the line is I like giving a little bit of color correction. So you'll see here, it's very subtle, but you can adjust the temperature globally of your entire shot. Okay, I just, because it, the, the shot was originally very warm, I like to cool it down just a little bit. Next node is is you'll see it's just darkening with the help of a gradient so just right here you'll see i can kind of just control um parts of my screen like this so i'm it, i'm really starting to paint with light a little bit and i didn't like how bright the upper right hand corner of the screen was so i darkened that just a little bit so next up as you can see it's going to be a radial gradient and this is essentially to add a vignette so this vignette effect darkens the corners a little bit but also i changed the temperature because as you can see right here, everything's way too warm. I really wanted to make the edges add a little bit more color variation in there. It really kind of cool down the corners of my shot to kind of help it feel a bit more balanced, right? You can see it already feels a bit more neutral, much, you know, much more interesting to look at just by adding a little bit of color variation in there. Now, next up is Glow. Now, Glow in DaVinci Resolve is known as Bloom in Unreal. So... There's different terms, but they mean the same thing. Now you'll see I've added a, a very selective bloom around the screen left here, just to, because we got a very strong sunlight coming in and I really wanted to, you know, add a little bit more flare there. Really, it, it's really as simple as that, just to give you an idea. Now next up right here is a lens flare and that's my favorite thing. Now lens flare when used tastefully is amazing. Um, don't go full JJ Abrams with the anamorphic lens flare all over the place, it just blinds you. Lens flare, when used tastefully, can really make your shot look way less CG, way less fake, and way more filmic. When you use a real camera and you're shooting into the sun, all your blasts get lifted, um, you get a very distinct effect. So let's toggle this on and see how it looks. All my shot has got washed out. So you'll see I've got some, some, some refractive elements here, some little bit of flares here. What you're seeing there is essentially glass elements inside the lens that are being reflected and captured by the camera. Um, the, the lens flare will also, like I said earlier, will lift up those blacks and give it a much more realistic look. 
So we use this carefully. Okay, so now that you can see, we've got a little bit of flare coming in. We have full control over the flare settings here. So you can control the size of the flare and how strong they are. Um, the lens flare tools in DaVinci Resolve are amazing, really good. I believe these lens flares require the studio version of DaVinci Resolve, but that's only $300. That's less than one year of paying for Adobe Premiere Pro. Just keep that in mind. Now let's move on to the next step, and that's adding chromatic aberration. Let's go ahead and turn on the chromatic aberration and zoom in and see what it's actually doing. Okay, so I'm gonna unhide this. You'll see, if I toggle it on and off, you'll see that we've got some red and teal halos happening around the edges, right? And it gets stronger and stronger as it gets near the edges of the screen. So chromatic aberration is a very real thing that happens in photography when you're shooting with real cameras. But there's one thing that I really need to make you guys aware about, and chromatic aberration is not a global effect. You can add chromatic aberration in Unreal. In the post-process volume, there's a setting for chromatic aberration. And when you apply it like this, you'll see right away that it's a global screen space effect. And that's what you don't want. I cannot stress enough how badly you do not want this because chromatic aberration in real life only shows up in high contrast areas. So just to show you an example of real chromatic aberration or fringing in photographs, I have a photo here that I shot here in Norway. And you'll notice along the ridgeline of the mountains, again, where there's a very high contrast difference, you'll see this bluish teal fringing, or also known as chromatic aberration, showing up. Now you'll notice it doesn't show up anywhere else in the frame, except, once again, in high contrast areas. So you see where there's like a very strong ping of specular highlight off the leaf, we get some teal greenish bluish fringing. It doesn't really show up anywhere else except in high contrast areas. We're trying to go for something that's, you know, photoreal as possible, something that's as realistic as possible, and chromatic aberration, while it does exist in real life, it really needs to be applied tastefully. I cannot stress this enough. So let's take a look at how I do this, okay? Okay, when I use chromatic aberration, I always apply it on first. So you'll see we've got it, it's very strong. I apply it globally everywhere at first, but then, here, with the help of a mask, I mask it out so that it only shows up in the very high contrast areas. So let's see, for example, right around the edges of Master Chief's helmet and the bright sky. Okay? I don't necessarily want it here because there's no contrast. So with this mask, I can, I basically just paint where I want chromatic aberration to show up. And it would make sense for it to show up here. It also makes sense that for it to show up, you know, a little bit here. It's very subtle. You'll see, you might not even notice it, but it's there. I'm going to show you guys this again in another shot. So let's take a look here as well. I've got chromatic aberration showing up only in the very bright, contrasty parts of my frame, right? If I were to hide this, you'll see chromatic aberration, if I toggle it on and off, it's showing up everywhere. Like all, you kind of almost have this anaglyph 3D effect, right? We have it all here in a building. We have it globally across the entire frame in the grass here. That's no bueno. That is not good. You don't want that. I want it in select places. So using a mask, I only have it showing up in the very bright spots. Okay, and that's how chromatic aberration really works in real life. So it needs to be applied carefully. So see, with the mask, before and after, we only have it showing up in the very bright areas. Super important part when adding chromatic aberration. So last but not least involves film grain. And film grain is one of my favorite things to add. It very much helps your shot go from pretty mediocre to like, whoa, this looks pretty good. Um, it's a very subtle thing, and it's not something that people always notice. And I understand that adding film grain may be a little controversial because photographers and cinematographers try to denoise their images and renders and films as much as possible, but they re-add that grain after because grain adds a very organic touch to your shots. So let's go ahead here and add film grain using DaVinci Resolve's film grain plugin. Film, the film grain plugin in DaVinci Resolve it requires a studio license once again, uh, but there's lots of film grain preset packs that you can get for the free version of DaVinci Resolve. I'm just going to show you what it does. So right now, you'll, you will you may notice my, my renders straight out of Unreal are very clean. And that's a typical thing with CG renders. 
they're super clean. There's no grain. There's no noise. And this is usually a good thing. You don't necessarily want a bunch of noise in your images, but it doesn't feel like a photo because all photographs have noise. Even if you're shooting at ISO 100 with a very good camera, you're still going to have a little bit of grain across your frame. That's just how images are created. So here I'm going to go ahead and add my film grain and just notice the difference it makes. Okay, like zooming in again, I'm going to go zoom in like crazy to 100% because this is a 4K render. But this is bef before and this is after. You'll see it adds a lot more texture and subtlety and just a little bit more organic feel to your renders, right? In a highlights, there tends to be a little bit less noise. And thankfully, in a DaVinci Resolve plugin, you have control here. You can control, you can add more grain in your highlight. You can choose to have less. You have a lot of film grain controlled in DaVinci Resolve. Let's take a look at another shot real quick, just to compare. This here is without any grain, and this is with. I've intentionally made it a bit stronger than I normally would just to show off the effect, but you'll see, especially in distance, ah, it just adds way more texture and a little bit more interestingness to your shot. Do not underestimate film grain. Film grain is an integral part of any movie. Pause your movie and you'll see there's always going to be that little bit of grain there. How much you add is up to you, but personally, I'm a sucker for a very high quality film grain. As you can see, with a very few changes, you can make your shots go from kind of meh to very good. And I understand that this may be controversial because some of you may be thinking, oh, well, that's cheating. That's not shared out of Unreal. That's, you know, you've color graded it. There's post processing involved. I'm like, well, well, yeah, of course, because I understand how powerful a good colorist can be. Okay, like I've worked in film, I've been floored and shocked and gobsmacked time and time again after seeing someone color grade my renders. And I'm fully aware of why you should be doing it. I said this before and I'm going to say it again. The end result is the only thing that matters. I cannot stress this enough. No one's going to care if you did some color grading in post after you rendered because that's just what everybody does. If you're not doing it, you're basically making your work not look as good as it possibly could. Let's just go through my other shots real quick, just to show you before and after, to get a better idea of how powerful it can be. This is before, straight out of Unreal, and this is after. Before and after. Moving on to the next shot, this is before, straight out of Unreal, and after. Before and after. Next shot, this is straight out of Unreal, and this is after. Before, after. Next up, straight out of Unreal, and it's an after. Before, after. And for the last shot, this is before, and it's an after. Before, and after. So just a recap of the main things that I like to change and do in post involve color correction, curve adjustments, vignetting, adding some more bloom, more controlled local bloom, lens flare, chromatic aberration, and film grain. Now, I know that sounds like a long list, but it's all these little things that really contribute to, you know, quote unquote, the deterioration of your CG to make it more realistic. Realism is not about having the sharpest, cleanest, best possible, highest resolution render. A lot of photos and a lot of movies are really blurry and have all these lens effects. And understanding this is really going to help you make your CG feel a lot more realistic. And that, folks, concludes this week's video. If you've done everything we've covered here, including the film back, the depth of field, the frame rate, the motion blur, color grading and post-production, if you do all of those things, your renders should be one step closer to looking a lot more cinematic than they did beforehand. So I hope this has helped you out. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and I'll see you all next week.